Hello everyone and welcome back to Bookish Ramblings. Today I am giving you some Christian fantasy book recommendations and you might be thinking that it's about time I did this video and I would have to agree with you. I have mostly series for you today, two standalones, and I'm really excited because I get to talk about a lot of my favorite series today. So without further ado, let's jump right into it. Let's just start things off with Fox by Nadine Brandes. First of all, let's look at this gorgeous cover. It's one of my favorites. It's embossed. It's just... This is a standalone and it is historical fantasy. And the only historical fantasy that I have on this whole list, so it is unique. But I will read you the summary from the inside flap. Thomas Fox is turning to stone, and the only cure to the stone plague is to join his father's plot to assassinate the King of England. Silent wars leave the most carnage, the wars that are never declared, but are carried out in dark alleys with masks and hidden knives. Wars where color power alters the natural rhythm of 17th century London. And when the king calls for peace, no one listens until he finally calls for death. Keepers think the igniters caused the plague. Igniters think the keepers did it. But all Thomas knows is that the stone plague infecting his eye is spreading. And if he doesn't do something soon, he'll be a lifeless statue. So when his keeper father, Guy Fox, invites him to join the gunpowder plot, claiming it will put an end to the plague, Thomas is in. The plan. Use 36 barrels of gunpowder to blow up the igniter king. The problem. Doing so will destroy the family of the girl Thomas loves. But backing out of the plot will send his father and the other plotters to the gallows. To save one, Thomas will lose the other. No matter Thomas's choice, one thing is clear. Once the decision is made and the color masks have been put on, there's no turning back. Remember, remember the 5th of November. The gunpowder treason and plot. That's all I know. This is the first historical fantasy book that I ever read, and I just thought it was the coolest thing ever. The second time I read this book, I actually listened to the audiobook, and I have to say the audiobook is, like, really, really great. I love the narrator, and his accent is just perfect for this book because he has an English accent. So Guy Fox was a real historical figure. The Gunpowder Plot was a real historical event, but there's magic. So people have these masks, and when they put on these masks, they can control different colors so if you're wearing like a brown mask you can control things that are brown a red mask you can control things that are red etc so it's just a super fun concept and it's actually a little bit educational as long as you can like separate you know the fantasy side of things from like actual historical events I did like look up more of like the actual story and the facts after I read this so that was really interesting like the keepers and the igniters represent the Protestants and Catholics and the conflict that was going on between them during that time in history. So that was really interesting. Um, there is a being in this book called the White Light and Thomas like talks to the White Light and it's like this whole thing. And the white light is supposed to like rep represent God or like the Holy Spirit. The white light has a very snarky, sarcastic tone in this book, which I don't like thinking of the Holy Spirit that way but it is fiction and you know the author took some liberties but overall that is what the white light is supposed to represent and you can definitely see that in this book and that's what makes it Christian um, but it is it's a really good book I liked it a lot highly recommend my next recommendation is Wistress also by Nadine Brandes and I have to say this is another gorgeous gorgeous cover one of my favorites look how beautiful it is Mirth was born with the ability to turn her tears into wishes but when a granted wish goes wrong, she's cursed. The next tear she sheds will kill her. She must travel to the well to break the curse before it can claim her life, and before the king's military find her. To survive the journey, Mirth must harden her heart to keep herself from crying even a single tear. Bastian's powerful and rare talent came in handy when he kidnapped the old king. Now the new king has a job for him. Find the wistress and deliver her to the schloss. But Bastian needs a wish of his own. He gains Mirth's trust by promising to take her to the well, but once he gets what he needs, he'll turn her in, as long as his growing feelings for the girl with a stone heart don't compromise him. Everyone seems to need a wish. The king, Mirth's cousin, the boy she thinks she loves, and they're ready to bully, beg, and betray her for it. No one knows that to grant even one wish, Mirth would pay with her life, and if she tells them about the curse, they'll just kill her anyway. Tell me that does not sound so amazing. 
and this book is amazing. I love the magic in this book. It's really cool and really fun. Like I just read, uh, Mirth, you know, her tears grant wishes. Bastion can stop time. Um, there's another character who's their blood is like deadly if it gets on anyone. I can't even remember like any of the other talents or banes. None of them are coming to mind at the moment, but it was just really cool and a lot of fun. Um, I would say like the, the Christian element of this book is not overt. It's definitely more subtle and you have to really sometimes be looking for it to catch it. And it shows up more like towards the end of the book, you really see the different things that represent Christian themes and God and different things like that. But I just think the author is super talented and I really like the way that she kind of wove that into the story. She's just like really good at it. This book is a standalone. The way it ended, I know some people were thinking that there should definitely like be a sequel. I'm okay with the way it ended. I personally don't need a sequel, but like I also wouldn't complain if there was one. Um, <laughs> but it is a standalone for right now and it's going to stay that way as far as I know. But it's just so, so good and I highly recommend, cannot recommend this enough. Next, we're gonna talk about some Chuck Black because literally, how can I not? First, his Kingdom series. This is medieval non-magical fantasy and there are six books, six small books. First, Kingdom's Dawn, Kingdom's Hope, Kingdom's Edge, Kingdom's Quest, Kingdom's Call, and Kingdom's Reign. These are like middle grade slash YA and they're really cool and unique from other books I'm talking about today because they're actually allegoric. So events and characters in these books parallel events and people from the Bible and it goes all the way from Genesis to Revelation. So I will just read you the summary from the back of book one. He's just a young man, but that doesn't change the truth. He was chosen. 16 year old Leonard thought he was a common farmer's son, nothing more. He wondered why his father had trained him for years to master the sword, not exactly a tool of the trade for farmers. But one tragic event initiates a world of revelation. Only then does he begin to understand his calling, a calling no other man in the entire kingdom of Arethre can fulfill, a calling given him by the king himself. Teamed with a young slave girl, Leonard is thrust into adversity and danger, for the dark knight and his vicious shadow warriors will stop at nothing to thwart the king's plan to restore the kingdom. Leonard will need more than a sharp blade and a swift hand to fulfill his mission and survive the evil plots of the king's sworn enemies. Journey to Arethre, where the king and his son implement a bold plan to save their kingdom, where courage, faith, and loyalty stand tall in the face of opposition where good will not bow to evil, and the future of a kingdom lies in the hands of a young man. <sighs> this series, this series is just really special to me. I first uh, discovered and read these books when I was 12 years old, and I feel like that's like a really good age and also younger. Like I said, these are middle grade. I think they say they're for ages like 8 to 12 or something, but obviously I think adults can enjoy them as well. It's a made-up land. Uh, a lot of made up like creatures and different things but again there's no magic but I just think Chuck Black is a really talented author and I do really like the fact that at the back of the book there are um, discussion questions and it tells you like what the parallels are and who the characters represent and everything in case you missed the allegory so I think that's really nice but it has you know the knights and the kings and queens and and sword fights and castles and all the things that I love so so much they also have the really nice like matte covers that we all love love these books always will gotta love the kingdom series next is the knights of a trace series by the same author and this is a spin-off series of the kingdom series so book one is sir kendrick and the castle of Belion, sir bentley and holbrook court sir dalton and the shadow heart lady carlis and the waters of maru sir quinlan and the swords of valor and sir rowan and the Cimmerian conquest these books also have very nice covers. They're also allegories, but the allegory is a little different from the Kingdom books. So these don't really parallel stories and people from the Bible, but more so like, well, I'll just read you what the author says 
in the author commentary in book one. Unlike the Kingdom series allegory, in which characters and events are based on people and events taken directly from scripture, the Knights of Erethrae series presents biblical principles allegorically. Each book teaches about virtues and vices conveyed through the truth of God's word. Sir Kendrick and the Castle of Belion teaches about loyalty, forgiveness, foolishness, and rebellion. So yeah, that's the that's the allegory in these books. Even though it's a series, most of these books can be read as like standalones. Each book is like its own contained story about all about different people. Um, it's not like a continuous thing like the Kingdom series is. So you can kind of read these pretty much in any order, except for. Uh, Sir Dalton and Lady Carlis. Lady Carlis is a continuation of events in Sir Dalton and the Shadow Heart. So you can read these other ones out of order, it really doesn't matter, but these two do need to be read in order and back to back. And these books, I feel like you don't really have to read the Kingdom series first to read, enjoy, and understand these. Like, you're not gonna like miss out or be confused about anything. For not having read the Kingdom series first. At the beginning of like each of these books there is an introduction to a Reth tray and it gives you like a very brief like overview of like the world and the king and his son and some stuff that happened. So yeah you don't really have to read the other series if you don't really want to. You can start with these but they're all really good. I love them so much. Um, each one is special and I can't really pick a favorite out of these six books but they're just super good and I love them and yes again highly recommend. Next let's talk about some Morgan L. Bussey. First her follower of the word trilogy. We have Daughter of Light, Son of Truth, and Heir of Hope. If I'm not mistaken, this was her very first, like, series that she ever wrote. It's not my favorite of her books. I'll get to my actual favorites in a minute. But they were still really good. Um, it, it took me a little bit of time to really, like, get invested in the characters and the story. But by the time I got to book three, I was, like, fully all in, invested. And I might have even shed a few tears at the end. As the Chardonnay rise in the west and war threatens the north, a young woman discovers she's not human. When Rowan Marr finds a strange mark on her hand, she is banished from her village as a witch. She covers the mark with a leather glove and sink, seeks sanctuary in the White City. She lives in fear that if she touches another person, the power inside her will trigger again, a terrifying power that allows her to see the darkness inside the human heart. But the mark is a summons, and those called cannot hide forever. For the salvation of her people lies within her hand. So this uh, trilogy has a lot of different perspectives in it, which if you know me, you know that's like not my favorite thing, which I think is part of why I didn't love this series at first and it took me a little bit of time to get into because there were some characters that I just like didn't really care about and I didn't want to read from their point of view. But they did eventually grow on me. The name for God in this world is probably just the word, maybe I'm thinking, since it's called Follower of the Word. I can't really remember um but yeah he's supposed to represent god but yeah it was good i don't really have anything else to say about it so now we'll just move on to my favorite series by the author and that is the ravenwood saga trilogy so good so amazing look at these covers it's gorgeous so book one is dropping books. Mark of the Raven. Book two is Flight of the Raven and book three is Cry of the Raven. Lady Selene is heir to the house of Ravenwood and the secret family gift of dreamwalking. As a dreamwalker she can enter a person's dreams and manipulate their greatest fears or desires. Soon after the gifting however Selene discovers that the Ravenwood women have been secretly using their gift to gather information or to assassinate those responsible for the fall of House Ravenwood to the Dominion Empire hundreds of years ago. As she becomes more entrenched in Ravenwood's dark past, Selene longs to find out the true reason behind her family's gift, believing that its original intent could not have been for such evil purposes. But she is torn about upholding her family's legacy, a legacy that supports her people. Selene's dilemma comes to a head when she is tasked with assassinating the one man who can bring peace to the nations, but who is also prophesied to bring about the downfall of her own house. One path holds glory and power and will solidify her position as Lady of Ravenwood. The other path holds shame and likely death. Which will she choose? 
and is she willing to pay the price for the path chosen? Tell me if that does not sound amazing. Dream walking, assassinations, magical abilities, like it's just way cool. So dream walking is only one of the powers in this book. So the different houses, um, like the leaders of these houses have different gifts. So there's dream walking. Um, there's also like the house of waters, the house of fire and earth, the house of wisdom, house of healing, house of light, and the house of courage. I like actually forgot about like most of these. I've had people ask me before when I've talked about this series, like how is it Christian? Because to them it sounds like very not Christian and even like a little demonic. So I would like to clear that up if I possibly can. And so the thing that makes this series Christian is as with most like Christian fantasy series, there's things that like represent Christian themes and there's, you know, a being that represents like the Christian God. And that's how it is in this series. So um, Lady Celine and House Ravenwood, they've always been followers of like the Dark Lady and they worship her and they follow her and all this stuff. They have their own like priests and everything. But Celine is tasked with assassinating this guy named Damien, but when she's like dreamwalking in his dreamscape, she encounters his soul and she's like, there's something different about this guy. Like this is the first time she's ever seen someone's soul that is so like bright and light and free of chains and darkness and there's like a piece that she's never seen before and she wants to learn more about it and she discovers that Damien is a follower of the light and the light is supposed to represent God in this world and it's very much like good versus evil and all that sort of thing and that's what makes this series Christian so I hope that clears it up for some of you. But yes, I love this series so much. It has so many of like my favorite tropes and different things in here and I can't recommend it enough. It's such an amazing series. I love it so, so much. It's so good. Next, I recommend the Blades of Actar series by Trisha Mingrink. We have Dare, Deny, Defy, Destroy, Deliver, and Decree. A blade never fails his mission. Third Blade, Leith Torn, never questions his orders or his loyalty to King Respin until an arrow wound and a prairie blizzard drive him to the doorstep of the girls whose family he once destroyed. Their forbidden faith and ties to the resistance could devastate their family a second time. Survival depends on obedience, but freedom beckons. How far does he dare go to resist the king and his blades? No matter what Leith chooses, one thing is certain someone will die. So yeah, it doesn't give you like too much information about the book, but this is a Christian non-magical medieval fantasy series. This is a more like realistic fantasy series, if that makes sense. Like there, like I said, there's no magic. Um, God is called God. Christianity is Christianity. The only thing that makes this series fantasy is just that it is a made up land, Actar, and yeah, that's like the only part that makes this a fantasy book. But like you got the assassins that's like one of my buzzwords i guess like I, anything that has to do with like assassins i'm like here for it okay i loved this series from the start but i think it was wasn't till like yeah it wasn't really till like book three to five that i was really like all in and like so attached to all of these characters so this is definitely my favorite book in the series my least favorite book would have to be destroy book 3.5 it is a novella and it's just about a character that like i really didn't care about but i still enjoyed it and I still like give it four stars. Also there is like a little prequel short story called Deal and it is about little baby Leith Torin when he's just a, a little person and it tells the story of how he became to be in service to King Respin. There's not really a lot to the story but if you're a fan of the series like you're gonna want to read it just because it's more from the Actar world and we got to take all that we can get okay. I got that one because I think when I signed up for the author's newsletter was how I got access to that one so I'm not sure where all you can get access for it but that's how I got a hold of it and I know I've mentioned before that the author was going to be writing more in this series but I have since learned kind of recently that she's actually not going to be writing anymore in this series because she's really happy where she left things in the last book and she's working on like other projects and other books now so she's just leaving it as it is which makes me very sad just because I don't want it to end but um it did end in a good place and I'm very happy. Also 
the last book, Decree, is pretty much just like a bunch of short stories and novellas bound together. And I didn't think I was going to like it at first, but it has a lot of really sweet stories. And I actually love it so much. Great series. Highly recommend. And then lastly, you know what time it is. We're going to talk about The Ilion Chronicles by J.L. Knight, my favorite series of all time. This is another non-magical medieval fantasy series. Are you are you catching a theme here? I really like my medieval fantasy. There's six main books, two novellas, and one short story. Book number one is Resistance. Two is The King Scrolls. Then we have Samara's Peril. Book number four is Exiles, and it is my favorite to cover in the series. It's so beautiful. I have it borrowed out to a friend right now. Book five is Bitter Winter. And then lastly, we have Dyke and Zare. And then we have a prequel novella, Half-Blood, which is about one of our main characters, Jace. And it's just like his backstory and more of his history and like when he was a kid and everything and events leading up to book one. And then we have Lacey, which is a novella that goes along with book five, Bitter Winter. And it's about these two characters and their love story. And it's just like the sweetest novella I've read ever read in my life. It is so good. It's so sweet. And then we have Tyra, which is just a super short story about Jace's wolf, Tyra, and how he came to be in possession of her. There's not much to it. It's just a little, little bonus for the fans, you know. Could God ever love a half-blood all of society looks upon with such fear and disdain? Jace once believed so, but when a tragic loss shatters the only peace he's ever known, his faith crumbles as the nagging doubts he's tried to put behind him descend on his grieving heart. With them come the haunting memories of the bloodstained past he longs to forget but can never escape. Taken from home at a young age and raised to serve the Emperor, Chiron Altair lives every day under a dangerous pretense of loyalty. After her unique observation skills and perfect memory place her into direct service to the Emperor, Chiron finds herself in further jeopardy as it becomes increasingly difficult to hide her belief in Elon, the one true god. Following the Emperor's declaration to enforce the worship of false gods under the penalty of death, many lives are endangered. But there are those willing to risk everything to take a stand and offer aid to the persecuted. With their lives traveling paths they never could have imagined, Jace and Chiron must fight to overcome their own fears and conflicts with society as they become part of the resistance. This series is so good and I'm just like so sad that it's over. I literally cried at the end of book six because it was the end of a journey that I have been on for the past several years. Yes, Chiron and Jace are our main characters, but there are many other perspectives that you read from. But in this case, I don't mind because I love all of the characters so, so much. It's kind of similar to The Blades of Actar in just that it is non-magical medieval fantasy. And there's a lot of like persecution of Christians and everything, except, you know, in this world, God's name is Elom and it's not called like Christianity but like there's like a resistance and everything and people have to like worship like underground and they're in hiding or else they might be killed so it's really similar in that way but this does have like some made up creatures and races of people whereas the Blades of Actar doesn't um, but that's like the most fantasy-ish thing in this series and I feel like also Jace and Leith are like similar in some ways but yeah such a good series so so good book three and book five are like my favorite books in the series and I kind of want to say that Samara's Peril is like my number one favorite because so many amazing things happen in this book you guys like it is just the best thing ever so much drama so much stuff is revealed things happen that you've just been waiting for like all this time and it's just like yes finally but then also book five something else happens that you've also been waiting for for the entire series and it's just like ah the feels all the emotions all of these series that i've talked about have been ya except for like i said the kingdom and knights of Ereth trade those are like middle grade and up um and this series is actually like officially labeled as new adult but i feel like it can really just pass for like ya like none of these books the violence in them to me is super like detailed or descriptive or over the top or like too hard to read or anything but I know that also depends on what you're used to reading and the kind of violence that you're used to like seeing or reading about. Um, I read a ton of fantasy and there's always like fighting and violence and stuff in those books so I'm pretty used to it so to me it's like 
these books like aren't anything but for sensitive readers it might be a little too much for you so maybe read these with some caution and knowing that there's going to be like some a little blood and violence and fighting and stuff like that but yeah i guess that's all i'm going to say about this series and that's all the books that i have to tell you about today so a lot of really great series um i'm definitely going to be doing like a part two and so on for the christian fantasy recommendations i also want to do like some secular but clean recommendations and i have a lot of ideas so more stuff will be coming so just stay tuned keep your eyes open for that but yeah let me know uh, what you think about the books that are recommended today if you've read any of them what you thought and if you have your own christian fantasy recommendations definitely leave them in the comments below thank you so much for watching and i'll see you in the next bookish ramblings video bye